uh, we've had a bit of an, an abortive attempt at this, but uh, this is take two. Uh, hopefully, we won't have any more tech issues. Um, this is take two of Mark and myself discussing a very important paper in the kind of canon of Boyd's work, which is evolutionary epistemology um, by Chuck Spinney. Um, this is a very, very important piece of um, work to study if you're really interested in in, in Boyd and Uda, because it, it really talks about his journey from destruction and creation, the paper that he wrote in 1976, which is really like the, the, the heart of the Uda loop, really, um, to his formulation of the Uda loop in the early 90s. So it's kind of, you know, covers 20 years of, of his work in, in evolution and his learning, which is why it's called evolutionary epistemology. So, Mark, why don't you um, share and, you know, share your perspective on why you think this one's so important. Oh, and by the way, the, the title of this talk is one of N, this, because we don't know how long it's going to take us to get through this. So, so this is uh, episode three uh, of our orientation dialogues. We're speaking from opposite sides of the Atlantic. And today we'll review... Um, the spinny paper, which is phenomenal, and I think that everybody should print this and 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 read it and reread it, um, because so often Uda is reduced to a four-step process, and I think that when you start with a paper like this, you realize that what John Boyd put into what people see only in the Uda loop, there's so much depth, there's so much thinking, there's so much research, there's a array of multi disciplinary uh, sources that he studied for years and years and years. Um, destruction creation, which is, as you said, was uh, in the year I was born, it was, I was three months old in September of 1976. Um, that's the result of lots of previous study that had led up to that. And then you think for the next 20 years, which we see in the diagram within uh, evolutionary epistemology, that goes all the way up to 1996. And uh, of course, uh, John Boyd passed away the very next year. But when people reduce UDA and they just look at it as a very simplified mental model, I think that this is a, a good place to start and really learn the scope and scale of the power of UDA loop and, and where it's pulling from. And I think that Chuck Spinney, who's, whose work we um, are going to talk about today, um, has really done a good job. And it's important to point out that Chuck was a friend and a collaborator of, of John and their, John Boyd. And there are some excellent videos on YouTube of, of Chuck presenting this presentation. So as we go through this, we're going to give, share our impressions. Um, Chuck has a nice disclaimer at the beginning of it that, you know, these are, this is his impression of uh, his personal view of John Boyd's destruction and creation and its centrality to the OODA loop and that any errors are his. So we would certainly echo that, that any errors that we make uh, in discussing this uh, belong to myself and belong to Ben. Um, and, and as he also said, this briefing should not be considered a definitive description of Boyd's work because Boyd's work is so vast um, and it really does deserve the exploration to see that it's so much more than just a four-step mental model. There's a lot to it. So yeah. that's, uh, that's a good place to start, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the, the thing for me, that destruction and creation, um, the thing that amazes me for something that's like, you know, 40, 46 years old, it's still 45. Well. It'll, it'll be 40, yeah, okay, 45. It'll be 40, 46 <laughs> in uh, September. <laughs> I, I know that one i, I, I do apologize um okay that's so fine. mid Not so, 46 so, yet. something that's in its mid 40s um which some would say is the kind of prime of life yeah um i'm actually amazed at how current destruction and creation is like it's a seven page uh, in fact i just put a link to it so i've created um short links for all of the resources that we're talking about here so if you want to read destruction and creation it's seven pages long and it's i mean worth every every bit of attention you can give it because the thing that amazes me about it is that it just remains so current with the kind of cutting edge of, of research in so many fields so yeah i highly, highly recommend reading that so i think what we'll do um well if the uh if the gods of um pre live presentation are, are kind to us we will do something like this and we'll just talk through the paper as we go Perfect. so i'll get rid of this um Get rid of that for now so it's not in the way um 
so yeah so as as mark said this is a personal view of boyd's work and this is our personal view of a personal view of boyd's work so uh, maybe we'll get into recursion later in the paper but um, i'm already liking it yeah, so perfect. yeah disclaimer i think we, we will definitely um definitely uh also agree with this and um so let i mean let's start with I made an observation about this when when the last live stream that we were on went down is that you know machine you could replace fight wars with anything machines don't do x people do and they use their minds and technology really is only ever an addition to what the people do um so you know as as happened earlier we were trying to do this about 10 minutes ago and and your your stream went down mark and we basically stopped and we started again um so it's people in their minds that we're really interested in, even though we're using the medium of technology to make this discussion possible. People, ideas, things. Boyd said that, and always in that order. And, you know, this is all about the mind. You know, that's I think that's the, the point that you and I always try to make is that OODA loop and, you know, orientation is really the, the highest level of this, the highest level of understanding, and it really needs to be developed and explored more because... That's how we engage our our world is is with our minds and everything that we observe, decide, and act and learn from, all flows from that uh, from that process of orienting within our within our minds. So, um, yeah, I mean, particularly important in today's world where technology is seemingly taking a bigger and bigger slice of life, and you know, we could talk about you know the algorithms that drive our attention and things like that, but you know, ultimately, it's people. And their ideas that that drive progress and technology will only ever be uh, uh, an amendment to that so maybe we should talk about um this vector of boyd's work i love this diagram and i think you've got another one that we can we can throw up um a bit later on in fact we'll, we'll do it straight after we talk about this so when you know when we talk about um you know this sweep i guess of, of boyd's interests like just destruction and creation came mid 70s and he'd already been responsible for um uh, what was the paper he wrote about fighter attack of maybe this was the aerial the that. aerial attack study the aerial attack study for which he'd dug deep into thermodynamics and and energy and he'd come up with this kind of seminal paper that's still used today for aircraft um uh, for for fighter pilots um so he wrote destruction and creation in I guess the middle of his 40 years of, of study and then this is the this is what covers the time between writing destruction and creation and then everything else he studied while he was still in the Air Force post Air Force when he got more interested in grand strategy so I mean is there any any particular ones in here that you would you would pick out I know there's certainly some that I will but I'll let you go first well I, I think for when talking about the paper um i mean we could we could have a we could have an episode about each one of these ovals here um <laughs> what's really what's really cool about this particular one is this this is as you're as you're alluding to i mean this is kind of the crossroads between boyd's active military life and then his life as a as a researcher and strategist and as a as a, as a thinker and you know, I would I would defer to Chuck and uh, and Chet Richards and ask them just to be sure. Go back to read the uh, the quorum book. Um, but as I recall, Boyd retired from the Air Force somewhere around seventy four and seventy five, and then he spent this sort of monastic time away with zero distractions to formulate what ultimately became you know that we, we know right before his death, the OODA loop, um, and it really started with this core of uh of scientific theory of fusing together a couple of different three different three specifically uh different scientific uh principles heisenberg's uncertainty principle uh godel's incompleteness theorem and the second law of thermodynamics and writing destruction creation thinking that we you know in order to achieve or i'm sorry in order to improve our capacity for free and independent action we have to continuously break and date our models, our understanding, um, both through deduction and induction. And the way that we think and the way that we sense, uh, the way that we perceive is going to determine how we 
how we process our observations, which in turn formulate into decisions, actions, and in, in, in looping back through a learning process. Um, this is really where it starts. And it's I think it's that sort of bridge point between the active fighter pilot that went to Georgia Tech to study to be an engineer, um, wrote with collaborated with another uh thinker his name is casey i want to say i want to say it was thomas christie on energy maneuverability theory which was used in, in aircraft design and then you mentioned the aerial attack study which if, if memory serves he wrote that as a captain in the air force and it's the definitive it's the definitive guide for air to air combat used by uh, nato forces still to this day yeah. so this was a really really amazing mind was what john boyd is and if you look at his uh all the resources that he pulls from and this this chart is a significant summary of of all of the things that he explored uh, i think on on chet's website slightly east of new there's a bibliography of all the books that boyd actually read and it's i think it's thousands um yeah and, and if you kind of get a feel too by looking at this chart and there's another version of it i think that that chet put out afterwards that's more updated um yeah. <laughs> it's extremely multidisciplinary it's not limited to engineering it's not limited to military and i think you start to get a feel you know we live in a volatile uncertain complex ambiguous world uda is a complex process for a complex adaptive system which is our our orientation our our mind the way we the way we think yep yep that's a that's a great summary i mean for me the things that really leap out of the page for me on this having you know I, I so i never never came across boyd at all in the military um i i came across boyd's work through the agile software development world and you know i i can't remember when exactly but i was i was starting to see some links between you know some of the kind of concepts of operating you know of military operations and um i think probably in the wardley mapping community you know, i came across this concept of uda and since then i guess in the last five six years you know i've i've trod the path of of studying many of these things as well so complexity self-organization theory of evolution by natural selection there's two fantastic books that i think everybody should read um if you're in the kind of military world then uh, it's dragons and snakes by um kilcullen and a more sort of wide, um, a wider book on on um, that's more interesting to economists is um, the Origin of Wealth by Eric Beinhocker. So both of those live up at the top right. Um, but the other thing that you know I'm very interested in as a you know former Royal Marine is guerrilla warfare, mm. Blitzkrieg, or what we now what we call in the West Mission Command, and. You know the impact or the the way that those interact with boyd's ideas you know he took a huge huge amount from from german military thinking i hope one day we'll get van, don van der griff on here to talk about you know the overlap of boyd and, and mission command and and things from blitzkrieg um and then guerrilla warfare um i i went on, i'm lucky enough to be invited on a great podcast um with um with ooda loop llc um, and we talked about, you know, the, 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 the dynamics that drive guerrilla warfare and, and to see Boyd really interested in that, you know, I've got a whole, whole bookshelf of second world war guerrilla warfare manuals. And I can't, I, I think I probably read them after or got hold of those after I'd already become interested in Boyd, but it was just Uda everywhere. Everything in there is, is Uda as you would expect, because it's a, you know, force on force, um, asymmetrical kind of environment. And that's what the OODA loop is basically perfect for. So, okay. Um, I think now might be a good time to, let's see if I can put this other, um, and, and, and by the way, we should, we, sh we should point out the, the wide applicability of this. I've, I've always tried to sort of demilitarize it because as you said earlier, you could cross out warfare and you could put hockey and, uh, business, uh, anything because the principles are, Universal guerrilla warfare is also a massive academic interest of mine. Uh, it has been for years, and I've always loved the concept that you can do so much more with less, but it always almost comes down to mindset. How did yep. somebody look at something? How did somebody think about something? Um, in most cases, I think when you overlay, when you're studying guerrilla warfare, you're looking at the difference between two 
two philosophies, two different, maybe a static mindset versus a dynamic mindset, et cetera. Yeah. But the exact same thing crosses over into business too. Oh, hundred percent. And I, I think especially with guerrilla warfare, the really interesting, um, the really interesting difference is that kind of bottom up emergent sort of unstructured behavior, usually in conflict with a top down hierarchical pre-existing structure. I think that's mm. a, you know, that's a dynamic that, you know, it doesn't have to be armed conflict, but that dynamic plays out again and again and again. So in this diagram that I just thrown up, we've got this extra Eastern philosophy arm here, which is really interesting because, um, you know, we end up down here with, with, you know, Toyota production system and lean, we've got a bit of Musashi in there. Um, and you know, I, I remember a couple of years ago, I had a conversation with, um, a chap who's a Japanese swordsman in the UK, um, who will, will definitely get on if, if he's interested. Um, and he'd never heard of Uda and mm -hmm. within about five minutes of me describing what it was, we were deep into the weeds of, of unpacking Musashi's ideas and, and how they relate fascinating so we'll, we'll definitely try and get him on it's amazing um, that the, the dynamic thinking that comes from very unlikely sources um which is sometimes why this can be quickly dismissed um, yeah you know yeah. It's, but it, i it's mean we can also see on the right here that you know this is where the final version of, of you know boyd's drawing of the oodle loop which is also my background on the slides mm. um you know we can see that th this took a a long time like when, when was boy doing his um his kind of big briefings to generals was that that was after he left the military right yeah that was all in the late 70s and the early 80s yeah and you know as the stories go i mean when you read about them and there is a lot of legend and you know lore but it you know the the core of it was that he was ostracized by his own service and found a very attentive audience in the United States Marine Corps, which is always trying to do more with less and always trying to reinvent itself. And um, contrary to most stereotypes of Marines, the, you know, the Marine Corps is the most intellectual branch. I mean, everybody- The same in the UK, 100%. Same in the UK, yeah. I mean, everybody, there's a, the Commandant of the Marine Corps has a reading list and everyone is expected to professionally read. Yep. Um, there's there's different books at different levels, and then there's books that we all should have read. And I've, you know, I've kept on that. I mean, I've been out of the Marine Corps now. I, you know, I've left active duty almost 18 years ago. So, um, but I still keep on that and that uh, encouragement to think and to gain other perspectives. I think when you notice that list too, you'll notice that it's not all just military books. There's yeah, there's other books, other books, too, that's incited to it or it's designed to incite and stimulate more uh, multidimensional thinking. And then as things continue to become, you know, more and more volatile and certain complex, and ambiguous, that reading and that knowledge, that learning, uh, that gaining of new perspectives um, is, is is critical. It's vital to survival. And that's really what he's, I think, really what Boyd was getting at when it, in this paper, destruction and creation, that if we don't do that, if we yeah. close off our system and we don't gain perspectives, we're so set on, and there's a great example we'll get to in the presentation, but we're so set on things being a certain way, or this is the way I learned it in school, or this is the way we've always done it. You'll see how, uh, how fragile that is and how vulnerable it can make a company, yeah. a sports team, anybody um, that doesn't thoroughly understand uh, the basic principles at work here. One thing I would add too, and I think what you and I and others that we know and see, you know, it, it says final version of OODA loop because John Boyd passed away. And if you look at this 20 year scope and then you factor in the, the 20 some years prior of his experience as an Air Force fighter pilot, he was always changing his perspective. He's always learning more. Learning was a yep. continuous process. So you know, hopefully we're uh, doing our part to carry that on. But that's really the point of Boyd in the course of his study is that, you know, if you think all of this is set in stone, take it out and burn it because everything's yeah. in the state of becoming. We have to keep developing these ideas and we have to keep discussing and learning. Yeah. So just just one more point on, on sort of Boyd's epistemology, I guess, before we move on. So I wasn't lucky enough, but I, I believe you've been to the Boyd archive, haven't you, at the at Quantico? I have, yes. Yeah. So I remember... A few years back a few guys went and they you know took a bunch of pictures of all of his books and 
you know all of all of the books that he's used as part of his kind of reading list i guess they all have extensive notes in them and, and he's always probing and questioning and and you know writing notes in the margins and thinking of ways to improve it and that's i mean i think that's the standard you should hold any kind of epistemology to right it's it's never well never maybe a bit strong there, there are some things that are pretty much well no i guess no it isn't i'll, I'll, I'll go back on myself nothing is ever set in stone right there's always improvements to be made and we'll we'll go through this in 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 the yeah. later in the paper where we talk about like the sweep of science and how there's always additions and improvements john boyd if you read the uh biography by Ro robert Corum called boyd the fighter pilot that changed the art of war he read something like seven or eight different translations of all of these uh like say sun tzu's art of war or uh clausewitz you know i mean he he took clausewitz down line by line you know <laughs> and accentuated the good and showed the showed the faults i think if i recall sun tzu the art of war was the one that he had the hardest time trying to punch holes in um, mm. because he thought it was uh was a superior work but even then you know john boyd was not someone to take something at face value he would look at multiple translations because sometimes the translators point of view uh come through with with translations um and you can see that in any, any number of any number of works that have been translated away from its original language or from the you know from the original author um yep. but i know that he i know that he he delved into multiple translations i've tried to actually follow his example there uh not with clausewitz but with uh sun tzu i think i have about six or seven different translations of art of war and there are some pretty key differences sometimes um that mm, are worth noting so yeah cool all right shall so, we... but, but for that but for the point of the paper it's worth pointing out though this really is zeroing in on his core questions of how he got started in the first place all that other stuff came later um but chuck's really zeroing in on sort of his foundational uh ideas that he laid out in destruction and creation which everything kind of flowed from i think before the stream went down we were saying you know that's the uh that's like the kernel that everything was built off k-e-r-n-e-l not not c-o-l-o-n-e-l yeah. but um the kernel that everything kind of flows from with boyd starts with destruction and creation and the things that he fuses together in that and everything kind of carries forward on that and that's why that's why i would tell anybody that again that reduces uda or dismisses it to really take a look at this and really think about this and and and, and give it the thinking it deserves because this is not a simple <laughs> it's not a simple concept it, it it's a complex yeah. concept designed for complex beings to you know to deal with uh, complexity yeah and th and that's a, a really interesting point actually because you know one of the things that um came up in the the other uda dialogues that i've been part of which was with um you know nigel and and ponch and dave snowden uh, who came along for the last one is that i think the conclusion that we came to is that you know uda is a it's a I guess a you know a a way station right it's not the ultimate goal i mean if boyd had you know hadn't passed away so early i'm sure we would have ended up with a different version or multiple different versions of what it is and it's really the process that we're talking about so i mean you know yeah. on this slide i think this is a good good segue into this slide it's a an interior mental orientation changing constructs of, or changing constructs of meaning that permit individuals or groups to cope with external conditions now this is a very interesting actually i i'm coming at this quite new because i last time i read this paper was you know quite a long time ago i haven't done a review before we kind of dived in here mm. individuals and groups now one of the very common kind of dispersions thrown at uda is that it's about you know individual tactical low level kind of intuitive you know combat scenario but actually when you when you start i think this is probably for later on in our series but when we start applying these concepts to groups group cognition group action group decision making and how that allows us to to cope with ex changing external conditions i think uda applied to teams and to companies and to organizations is actually way way more interesting than uda applied to individuals 
Well, I think that um, you're hitting on it because groups and teams and companies and organizations, they're made up of people. They're made up of individuals. Their orientations align. So what one does, it happens at every level, you know, tactical, operational, strategic, or small picture, middle picture, big picture. You and I had a discussion maybe two or three years ago where we were talking about UDA being fractal, that yeah. it it scales at every level to some extent. I mean, that's why the Marines are the Marines or the Royal Marines are the Royal Marines, because at some point, individuals come together and their orientations align and they end up creating a, a culture. You know, um, I had a pretty good, I don't say heated, but it was it was a spirited back and forth where, where both of us, I think, walked away with a lot of learning with, with one of my mentors, uh, former commander. And, you know, he kind of pushed back on that, that orientation, or, or sorry, that UDA is not fractal or, you know, orientation is not fractal. But then I kept saying, well, how, do, how can we explain the culture from top to bottom? If, if, if there's people there together that are aligning and subscribing to certain ideas and they're characterized by certain things like mission command or, or physical fitness or, you know, other things that sort of hallmark that culture. You can, you can take people from all over the world, from every background, from every, uh, every type of demographic you could think of, but there they are aligned together individuals as a group or a team or a tribe. Um, and that's really, to me, that's the scaling, that's the culture, you know, so. Yeah, um, and that's a super or, interesting kind of process that that you go through there, because, you know, to, to our point about, um, you know, guerrilla warfare versus kind of, you know, guerrillas versus established um, hierarchical structures. Hmm. I mean, one of one of the things you do to build that kind of culture is you you drive out a certain amount of diversity, right? There's, I mean, there's, there's always individuals and individualism but in the military and in it in any in any team there's some aspect of that that's kind of subsumed in order to build this kind of shared i mean we would call it orientation as as um as um Boydians, i guess but um Gen yeah, general McChrystal call, he, he called it shared consciousness in yep. uh team of teams like how did how does a how does an organization in his book, he, he's talking about Joint Special Operations Command. How, how does a massive organization that's all over from various cultures, you know, be they Rangers or SEALs or um, Delta Force, et cetera, how do you get everybody on the same page? In other words, how does orientation scale beyond uh, one person or a squad or, you know, how does it, how does it scale? Um, and become pervasive throughout an organization to build a, a culture of top down and bottom up where, you know, a, awareness, uh, situational awareness flows freely. I think we mentioned on one of the last podcast or uh, presentations talking about um, the strategic corporal, you know, yep. the, the concept of the strategic corporal, how intent can go all the way down to the lowest level of leadership on the ground and with, with, without, with the trust that, the mission will uh, will carry through. You know, yeah. that there's that trust that goes top to bottom. If I recall, I gave the example of how, you know, you never would tell Marines what or, you know, how to do anything, or you tell them what to do, but not, not how to do anything. As long as they understood really the why, the intent, they could come up with their own, uh, their own ways to, to, um, uh, to make something, to make something happen. They're, they're free to use the constraints, you know, to operate within the constraints to do, whatever's the most effective. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, but I do think that it scales. I have sort of a working thesis. Google the Sierpinski triangle. It's like a Nisosceles yeah. triangle made up of different levels of, you know, I, I kind of think of like we all have the same common core values or, you know, uh, say like mission command or, you know, our core values as Marines or whatever. It should scale at every level that, that, that cultural yeah. um, characteristic should, should scale at every level. Yeah, and I think it'd be very interesting to do a future, a future episode, maybe yeah, you know, maybe with Stu Scheller if he would um, he would be kind enough to come on to talk about what happens when that doesn't, you know, what what the implications are of that not happening, right? When when that does break down, you know, the yeah, we will we'll definitely do a future session on mission command, but when that trust does break down in leadership and 
when you know when you think that the standards that you are held to at some lower level in an organization do not be are not held to at the higher levels of an organization what the effects of that are and what and, happens to people when they try and call it out and try and not you know try and mitigate that degeneration and you, and you could pull from several areas too in addition to that let's say kodak you know and imagine the book billion dollar lessons is great imagine the digital photography only to be destroyed by it in the long run and imagine you know the the board and the ship of that company saying well we made all our money on film and we've done everything yeah. with film and film 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 and that's all they think so something innovative and i i think polaroid went down the same way you know they couldn't get out of their mind that things were changing um and at that high level they wouldn't allow for the change or you know an easy one buster and Netflix, you know, Blockbuster saw itself as a retail experience and Netflix saw itself as a let's get movies to people in their homes, the fastest experience. So um, the, the disconnect times and, and that, again, that can scale it. That, that to me, I think sort of um, supports our case that we think that it scales at, uh, at different levels. And if a touch are misaligned or if there's not a harmonization or as Jeremy Crystal says, you know, a shared consciousness, you're going to have a lot of problems because you're not going to be able to maintain the necessary situational awareness to not only survive, but to thrive, you know, yeah. or, or as, as, as we talk about in the, or I'm sorry, as Chuck points out in Boyd's paper, or as Boyd would say, uh, you can't improve your capacity for free and independent action without that kind of consciousness, without yeah. that kind of, you know, open dialogue, willingness to learn that kind of thing, all those things that kill organizations and teams yeah uh, imagine if you will right that's a yeah mission yeah you create an imaginal line yeah the interesting thing like with the uh, let's um well i guess this is a good a good time to kind of move on to this but um in fact let me just see if i can get a better um nope not like that there we go so uh, these slides are definitely not designed for modern 16 by 9 screen screens are they okay so that's now we've got the whole the whole slide in here and you know we're talking about i mean this is the core of everything we talk about i think is this this bit highlighted in yellow to survive and grow relatively free of debilitating constraints individuals and groups must take decisions and take action must make decisions and take actions to overcome physical obstacles and social competitors i mean this is this is the the driving dynamic that drives everything we see around us yeah i, I wrote a note i wasn't going to talk about economics in this uh but <laughs> it's hard it's hard it's hard not to but you know that's human action everything is a result of human action which is a result of a human decision which came from a human's orientation and it was shaped by their own mindset and uh method of thinking shape their views and visions um you know I've, I've had people tell me for years well this doesn't apply to me or it doesn't apply to us or it doesn't apply to a group like ours or does it apply to a team like ours or a company like ours whatever i say you might be right i would suggest that this only applies where human beings are making decisions and actions I mean, that's that's sort of the universality or that you know the axiomatic yeah. I, that's why i think like you know uda you know, again, this is McGrath's thesis. This isn't Spinney or Boyd, but I think a bit more of a, it's a map of how our orientation functions. Uh, it's an axiomatic process because you could clearly show that 100% of everything you do is the result of an observation, decision, and action that process through your operating system, that process through your orientation. But we, I mean, that's another rabbit hole, but I think that that's what's being affirmed that if we don't understand that, if we don't understand decisions and how they're shaped, if we don't understand observations and how we shape them, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. You're not going to increase your capacity for independent action. You wind up, uh, you know, me 45 showing my kids a roll of film and explaining what it was and explaining how you went to the drugstore and you wrote out an envelope and put it in. And like three days later, you'd get your pictures 
back and then you'd look through it and you'd say, Oh, look at all these wasted pictures. Cause somebody photo bummed me or whatever. Yep. And the kids would say, <laughs> can't you just delete that? Like, can't, you know, that, yeah. yep. um, that's, that's the end result. That's what could, yeah, could happen. You know, or, or you get, you know, kids, kids saying, you know, you show kids a floppy disk and say, Oh, cool. Somebody 3d printed the, uh, the save icon. And that's, I mean, that's a fascinating, like there's so much to unpack right there, isn't there? Like, you know, if you but, don't, if you don't destroy those models, if you don't destroy and create models and your new understanding, your perception, you're going to, your, your observations will be misaligned. Your decisions, your actions, and your ability to learn and refine will be misaligned from reality. And ultimately that's why you'll be irrelevant, obsolete, out of business, destroyed in, in whatever. I mean, that's, what Boyd is trying. To, that's the real message, I think, behind all this. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's one more kind of aspect to that is that when, when a mental model or a, a, you know, a piece of your orientation is destroyed, it's never really destroyed because, you know, like our modern cities, right? What, what is there, the older the city, the more ruins of previous cities that that city's built on. And it's exactly the same with orientation. Like the, you never, um, you never start from scratch. You never destruct, destroy everything back down to the, to the sort of basic foundations. You've always got some, well, very rarely, like that's a very high energy thing to do, right? So most often it's a small tweak. It's probably a power law, really. It's like most often it's a small tweak to your, your orientation that just gets you fluent in, in a small change that's happening in your environment every now and again like there's a paradigm shift of you know blockbuster versus netflix and oh actually no now it's digital and and online delivery mm -hmm. and it's those ones that i think you know it's either that's a step change that you haven't seen coming or you haven't been destroying your mental models enough that it's it's a step change so the so interesting kind of Think think of how many versions. Speaking from Netflix, I mean, I remember when you put Netflix in the mail and you got a D in the mail and you returned it via the mail. I mean, net, Netflix now is not like that. Well, it's always mm -hmm. in the state of becoming. You know, it's always crashing its model and and rebuilding to stay to stay relevant. Yeah, well, um, the Netflix of... architecture actually is fascinating. Like the way that they build, like that 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 philosophy of of operating. Mm defines everything they do i mean they, they even build their technology so that it's constantly they have this have you heard of this thing called the chaos monkey that they have yeah i have yeah so it, it's like when you come up with an idea right that the chaos monkey is designed to like or, or it's a process to come and like rattle the cage and challenge the relevance of something is that the uh it's someone on let me just, just turn this off for a sec so um so Netflix Chaos Monkey. I don't know how. Like again, this this might be something that was a transitory thing, but the the Chaos Monkey from Netflix was a a process that ran within their data centers and within their technical architecture that would randomly kill stuff. Hmm. So it'd just randomly go around and kill something, in order that every single thing that Netflix released and relied upon had to be resilient. Hmm. So it was a. Um, I mean, we were talking a bit about hormesis the other day, right? It's a it's a stressor in the environment, a, a an external uh, or a, an artificial stressor in the environment that is designed mm. such that any aspect of what you put into production in that environment has to be resilient. So you can't have single points of failure. You can't have um, weaknesses in the system because there's this kind of um, stochastic process that's running that means that there's nothing that will survive long term in that environment and the whole system has to be robust to that. And that's orientation in a box, really. Think of all the, again, not to, I mean, we could talk business, we could go really anywhere with this, but when you think of all the times in combat where the leader was taken out and someone had to step in, um, you know, or the plan didn't go, it, nothing, nothing happened the way it was supposed to happen. And they had to continuously, you know, reinvent and, um, adapt to circumstances that were changed or prepare for that. I mean, I remember in training, like, you know, you're dead. Now what, <laughs> you know, somebody else has got to, got to take over and, and, and be prepared for that kind of, you know, that 
required resilience that you're going to need. You know, yeah. now think about this too. If you don't have shared consciousness, if you don't have a culture, if you don't have a culture of, uh, you know, info sharing or, or, or you're not oriented that way. Imagine if that person that's hoarding the information is taken out, <laughs> then what yeah. happens, right? Nobody, nobody's going yeah, I mean, to there's two, there's two really interesting aspects to the, the military doctrine side of things, right? There's the, the, there's the shared consciousness in the moment, right? There's mm -hmm. the, you know, how do you actually, you know, what are the mechanics of having a shared consciousness across, you know, thousands of people deployed in, you know, different environments, different organizations. So that's the subject of team of teams. But then there's like the meta process that allows that to even happen at all, right? So there's having the shared consciousness. And then there's the, the thing that the military does really well, I think, is it builds the meta system and the communications protocols that en allows the emergence of a shared consciousness. And that's the thing that, you know, so many people cargo cult the shared consciousness or, you know, they try to, they think they are, but mm. actually the thing that the thing that the conditions for that to survive are not even there in a way. Yeah. It's, yeah. Well, that's another, another chain another line of discussion away from the topic at hand but that just makes me think yeah of, so let, um, let's get back to the topic at hand. yeah let's put, stick the, on. Uh, put the screen back up <laughs> yeah um okay so so we moved on to the next slide now so how do we generate the mental concepts necessary to, to support this decision making activity so actually what we were talking about just now is not that far away from from this question yeah pure accident but you know how do we evolve mental concepts identify what decisions and actions are necessary or appropriate, monitor the effects of actions to support subsequent decision making. Actually, we bang on what we were just talking about, because this is something that the military has evolved a system to do this incredibly well, right? A system that is independent of conditions on the ground. It's independent mm -hmm. of like the implementation. It's a template that works across multiple different domains. And it's also a template that means that different branches of the military or different, you know, even different militaries from different um, uh, different countries can come together and use this shared template as an interface. Um, and that's really like exactly what we're talking about here, right? It's the, um, what's the word we're looking for here? I guess it's like the meta the meta system that lies underneath, like, you know, you go into somewhere like Afghanistan, you, tw you spend 20 years there, mm -hmm. you learn a load of stuff about conditions on the ground in Afghanistan and how they differ from conditions on the ground in Iraq and, and whatever else. But the, the system that allows you to move a body of people into that hostile environment, operate effectively and learn those lessons is the same in you know, it was the same in Iraq. It was the same in Afghanistan. I don't know. Does that, this is, this is quite difficult to kind of. Yeah. I think it's more of a cultural thing though. Like I think it's more of a, um, I th cause I think it's more organic. Like sometimes I think the template, there are templates and heuristics that we use, but these are all things that have been uploaded into our orientation. Um, one of the ways I explain orientation sometimes, cause I think that that's really, you know, how do we generate models? Well, our orientation, observes orients decides acts right we're constantly reoriented we're constantly learning that's the that's the really easy answer um and and templates are are part of that and but when you're when you're out there you know you think of it you know the, what do you go with the map or the terrain i mean it's good to have those maps but when you're out there doing it live it's it could be different. You have to have, and I think that's really what we're getting down with the structure creation. You have to have that ability to destroy that model when it doesn't match up to the reality. You have to have yeah. it and build a new one. Um, you know, I, I, sometimes I explain it, you know, in the technology mimics nature, right? You know, the, the orientation is one's iOS, right? Our internal operating system. And if we, if we don't update that, just like our, our, uh, you know, smartphones or whatever, if we don't update that, we're not going to be uh, relevant or protected against novel threats. Um, it's not going to be able to function correctly. It's the same. It's the same thing with orientation. If we're not destroying and creating 
destroying our old understandings and creating new understandings as things change. Yeah. We're going to become obsolete and we're not going to, as the paper says, we're not going to be able to uh, improve our capacity for, for free and independent action. And that's how our, that's how our mental concepts evolve. I mean, you think of what our understanding of the world now at our age, I mean, how many models have we smashed Mm. (laughs) to, you know, to create the new ones? Um, I mean, we were talking earlier about old Netflix or a roll of film, you know, yeah. Um, it, you know, we've had to constantly spend, and, and, you know, how, how we're interacting with ex- external events. I think you saw yesterday, I put on LinkedIn, uh, how Grubhub is delivering things on Ohio State University's campus yeah. with, with droids, basically, right? I mean, it's yeah. like Star Wars, like a Star Wars movie, um, and that was a new thing I hadn't learned. And a buddy of mine who works at Ohio State, he's a professor, he's a uh, uh, teacher there. And he uh, he put, hey, those that's old news. It's been around since fall. But since COVID and my kids no longer swim there every day, we stopped yep. going there in spring. So I, I wasn't aware of it. You know, it was something that I didn't know. So, But now that old model of Ohio State pre-droids delivering food to students, <laughs> you know, that's been shattered. And there's a new one now kids get on their phones and this robot delivers them uh pizza <laughs> just like the jetsons i mean that's it's crazy yeah yeah so, no, it's really point. neat the amount of effort that you used to have to go through to get stuff right so should we move on um, yeah so here's our, our old friend the uh, the simplistic oodle loop simplistic oodle loop yeah don't do it <laughs> <laughs> don't do it <laughs> yeah so okay, so talk but that's what the, that's what's happening. Problem. But 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 it's like he said, there's a, a massive problem. Yeah, when this is simplified to this, yeah, you're 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 going to get the opposite of one what John Boyd said. You could get if you understood these things. If you understood it the the correct way or the effective way, I don't say correct because it's always in a state of becoming. But the if, if you understand it all effectively you're going to get geometric results that your competition is not going to be able to yes. keep up with. If you simplify it, you're literally tying your hands, your legs, everything. I mean, you're, you're tying yourself down. You're, 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 you're creating impediments and you're not unleashing the power yeah. of, uh, of what you can do with your orientation. Yeah. So, I mean, having said that though, this version is better than no version at all. Right. I've, I've seen, um, I've seen some simplistic, explanations of of uda there's a there's a video like i think if you search on youtube one of the first one first ones that comes up is a a couple of police officers explaining uda and it is using this simplistic version it's not going into any of the depth that we go into but it's mm. it's talking about tactical actions in the moment and it's actually a lot better than not having that at all i would agree and i would say that that if if that is people's entry point, that's fine. Yeah. And I think that what we're trying to encourage them is to is to is to think of it more along the lines what what Chuck Spinney's talking about in this paper and think about more along the lines of of Boyd and how it influenced. You can do that and be very good at that, whether it's tactical policing, whether it's uh playing basketball. I've and I've I've talked with uh basketball teams i've talked with yeah. you know my kid my kids lacrosse team i mean you can do that uh very efficiently you know maybe effectively the more you understand it though the deeper you dive on it and the broader you create your awareness around it i think that that's where you really start to unleash the power yeah um because remember you know when they were when when and, and and chuck could tell us this story i guess it's in the quorum book i mean they were going to classify this top secret Really? They didn't want anybody. They didn't want anybody to know, you know, how to how to achieve geometric results. <laughs> they, they don't want the uh, the opposite team in those days, I guess. To to uh, well, that's that's kind of ironic, isn't that. it? Considering uh, considering the way some of our our kind of cultural adversities on the geopolitical stage seem to be using UDA quite quite effectively in social media and and grey warfare. Perhaps that perhaps that was a good idea and. Perhaps we shouldn't be in a position to be even talking about this. So one, one thing I will say about this simplified version of UDA before we move on, one of the things that I certainly fell victim to for a time is that this is a simple enough explanation that it traps people here for quite a long time. 
it's almost yeah. like a you know a phase transition in 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 boiling liquid right there's a there's a period at which it's at the boiling point and you need to pump a load more energy into it before you move on to that kind of next phase and the problem with this this diagram is that it scratches enough of an itch that it makes you feel like you understand something which makes you then not look for further answers mm. lulls you into a false sense of knowledge i guess kind of yeah it's a it's a recipe it's not a yeah it's, it's not a it's a prescription it's not a subscription yeah I mean, we're, okay. we're getting let's people move, to... let's move on then because we've, yeah. we've seen enough of this we don't want people to rest here <laughs> any more than we do we don't want anybody to think that's the <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, here, here, this is what we're talking about, right? I mean, this is that if you're if you're going to focus on this simplistically, if you're going to reduce it, if you're going to dismiss it, it's going to come at a it could come at a massive cost because you might not have the correct frame of mind that's going to help you deal with whatever reality uh, is unfolding in the environment that you're operating within. You know, business, war, sports doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, it makes it makes it seem like you have to go all of the through all of the steps before you are able to go through any of the steps again. Which what well, I mean, it's not the case at all. Yeah. And no matter how much alike we think we are, or even if we're on the same team or we're both Marines or we're both uh, you know, work for the same company or whatever, what, what he says there, you can't separate or observations from everybody's individual experience because everybody's orientation is completely unique. There's alignment, there's commonality, but everybody is, is, uh, is completely unique. Yeah. Okay. So well, what are we, what are we talking about here? So there's, there are two ways. Well, that avoid... last, that last question on the previous page is critical then. So how do we, revo how do we evolve our, relevant orientation, right? So how do we ensure that we're keeping our orientation matched as we're, he says, apprehending, but I, you know, sometimes I use the word anticipating, you know, the complexity of the things that we're going to experience as everything is unfolding. And, you know, the easy answer is that's how we, we what we need to do is next page, you know, we need to destroy and create models, right? Yeah, we need to create and destroy models. We need I just to... want to, I just want to, before we move on to the next slide, actually. Yeah. I just want to pick up on the word evolve here. Right. Yeah. You know, evolution is a process that absolutely requires or absolutely negates the possibility of, of, um, starting from scratch, right? It's a mm. continual process. There is no, you know, you don't drop somebody into a brand new situation and have them just create an orientation they always bring their previous you know call it baggage call it experience call it skill mm. whatever mm -hmm. so you're always evolving as in a step process where you're tweaking and changing small aspects of your orientation you know the challenge is sometimes the world moves so quickly that you have to be able to do that faster than you're really comfortable with so okay um so now we're now we're into i guess the meat of analysis and synthesis or, or destruction and creation here right yeah it carries on from what you were just referring to one's previous experience our our cultural backgrounds the other things that that void listed with which within our orientation one of the critical components of that is analysis and synthesis and putting it in simple terms anal analysis how do we break things down to their components um, and then uh, synthesis. How do we fuse together? Uh, how do we fuse together something novel that that didn't previously exist? You know, how do we, you know, um, when, when well, well, I guess we'll get into it. But like, you know, I think of um, I was trying to think of back to that Kodak example. Yeah. Um, how do you how do you create that you know how do you build that new novel thing and and get uh yeah so that's so that's actually a really interesting example because that's both analysis and synthesis at the same time isn't it like because mm -hmm. your you know situational awareness has has those three the three steps um and analysis is 
like understanding what what you're kind of seeing so you know breaking things apart but in order for kodak to have made the right or, or cat or you know um polaroid or whoever to have made not the right decision but better decisions mm. it's actually the synthesis that's more important because you're you're breaking down you know if you if you break down your current knowledge and you stop at you know we're the market leader we've got all this market share we've got all this revenue where does the knowledge of the external environment and the changes that you can't yet see come in mm. cuz you can't you can't analyze something that hasn't happened yet you can only synthesize the likely trajectory of some of something and that's an interesting kind of thing to you know in some senses synthesis is analysis and analysis is synthesis because you're and this is why i love this part of destruction and creation you know, my, my background as a technologist is in um, functional programming mm. and what we're really talking about in functional programming is we're talking about folds and unfolds and there's a whole you know there's a whole, maybe we'll do a, a session on this but there's a whole branch of mathematics that i don't profess to fully understand called category theory and mm -hmm. it's really all about how how things map from from one to another and really you know in, in this um this this algorithm a fold is an unfold and an unfold is a fold and we're talking about analysis and synthesis and really when you start really picking apart these examples of corporate failures i guess the you know it's very difficult to actually figure out which part is analysis and which part is synthesis because they're they're all kind of co-evolving at multiple different scales at different times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of time. Would would you think too that someone that's bring that's synthesizing a new direction or anticipating or imagining a new direction that they're a heretic? You know, like the, the they're going against the uh, they're going against the status quo. So imagine you're that developer and you've created digital photography which is going to forever change the world and you're dismissed um it's too dangerous it's nothing to worry about it's too expensive and you're just thrown to the side i think there i think it was um the last the previous comment on the marine corps he said we have to protect our innovators you know sometimes the innovator yeah. is is the heretic that's going to get tied to the stake and, and burned right because um they saw what what others did by the way that's that's another uh, you know gary klein seeing what others don't you know yeah sometimes that person who sees what other others don't is a conspiracy theorist or is a is a quack or yeah. you know um i mean think of all the things that you've read about steve jobs but i always think about all the negative stuff people yeah but he wasn't nice to people or yeah but he was this or that or whatever um because that radical innovator is such a threat to some existing apple cart <laughs> yeah. that he's he or she is trying to trying to push over and they don't know how to uh deal with it i, I i'm trying to think what was it gandhi that said first they fight you or first they laugh at you then they fight you and then they join you right mm. um when you bring yeah some... so it, it's it's interesting though because i mean this is the this is the the difficult thing because on the whole if you're a if you're a company or a you know a military side and in a dominant position then the the most sensible thing you could do is continue to do what works mm -hmm. right and there is a you know you have to make decisions about how you deploy your resources and if you're in a, what appears to be a dominant position you should deploy your resources in order to maximize your returns on that dominant position and anyone who's being a heretic or a dissenter at that point is essentially telling you to minimize your returns right or to not maximize your returns right because you're you're being told to you know not make hay while the sun shines mm. and this is I, there's a great book called loon shots by safi bakal who's a um mm. an entrepreneur and a um uh, phys uh, is a physicist? I think his background was physics, but you know he uses the 
the science of phase transitions here as well. Um, and, and this is analysis and synthesis, absolutely, because the whole time you've got a division of your organization making hay while the sun shines and maximizing your returns, you really, really have to have a small cadre of, you know, people trying to, I don't know, play a red team. Like, you know, we, we, we're both so, fans so, of red so, teaming, right? So it's, so it sounds like you're saying you need a, you need a John Boyd and his acolytes, right? I mean, because think about how he was treated in his own, yep. his own service. And somebody put on LinkedIn when I, I put a picture of uh, John Boyd's grave in section 60 of Arlington, where I've been to countless times. Um, and I always go see Colonel Boyd amongst others, but um, you know, the legend is the only airmen at his funerals, there was maybe one representative and the, the two airmen that are carrying his urn at the, at the Fort Meyer chapel and everybody else was, it was Marines, mm -hmm. right? Cause we embraced you know, the Marines embraced John Boyd, but he, or not say, but, and I think he's a great example of what you're talking about. I mean, he's that person that came up with the design theory, energy maneuverability theory, which led to the, uh, a 10 and the F 15, the F 16, yep. the F 18. And you're not allowed to talk about them. You're not allowed to, uh, yeah. well, not in that, in the Marine Corps, you're not only allowed to talk about them, you're allowed to celebrate them and you're allowed yeah. to reference them to the cows come home and, 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 you know, do what we're doing, <laughs> take it out, out of the Marines and then take it somewhere else. But you know, that, that kind of, um, that, that kind of, uh, heretic, if you yeah. will. I mean, just imagine the person that said, uh, was it Ptolemy or, or was it no Copernicus who said, you know, I don't know. The earth isn't the center of the system. I think it's actually the sun, you know? Yeah. And they're like, ah, you're going to be excommunicated for that. Like you don't want that. Do you? You don't want to be kicked out of the club. No, I'll give you another Boyd reference. There's the famous one to be or to do. Well, probably yeah. the synthesizer is the one who's doing right. You're the, you can be and you get all the promotions and the money and the, and the and the respect and all your buddies like you and this and that. But to do, you're that radical that's changing things. You're that Steve Jobs or John Boyd character, you know, that's um, looking to evolve and change because you know that things change and you understand these principles that that, you know, Spinney's breaking down here, showing us what Boyd was talking about. You understand that's the way the universe works. Yeah. And, and yet, you know, both both of us come from a culture that I think, you know, we, we would say that they embrace that um, philosophy. You know, the Royal Marines are the UK's commando forces, um, sort of irregular troops. The US Marines obviously wholeheartedly embrace Boyd and, you know, have built much of their current doctrine and, and thinking around his ideas. Mm. And yet, both of our organisations who we would say are, you know, towards the most progressive end of this you know spectrum that we're, we're talking about are still victim of you know covering up and not learning lessons and things like that so you know in the in the royal marines case one that really springs out to me is um the the controversy surrounding marine a who um uh, sergeant um uh alexander blackman who who killed a killed an insurgent in Afghanistan and the and the fallout from that, mm. and you know his commanding officer at the time has been trying to not point fingers, not a, a portion blame, but just trying to get the lessons learned, trying to get the analysis done, mm. right? And you know he ended up resigning his commission mm. because well, it's you know too deep to go into here, and then you know in the in the U.S. Marines at the moment um we've got obviously Stu Scheller and and his attempt to get some kind of um accountability from senior leadership um so think, I think about both of these are oh. examples of failures of this kind of dynamic of analysis and, synth and synthesis really when you when you really break it down so yeah you wonder you know you're well we I think we talked about it in one of the other episodes about you know where where plants the, the where the seeds of comfort are planted so grows the garden of complacency um <laughs> yeah. that's i guess i invented that i guess but uh or not invented it but you know i'm 
pulling from other sources to come up with that statement. And then you're somebody, you're that voice in the wilderness showing, hey, this is the way, or at least not necessarily that I'm right or not necessarily that somebody's right. Let's at least red team it and consider that there might be a flaw or there might be a blind spot, you know, and when you have the things that Boyd talks about, when you have uh, mutual trust, when you have that um, that cohesion and that that harmony, you know, between, uh, amongst levels when it scales up and down, I think you're probably less likely to have those things. And where you see those things, what you're talking about, that's really where, you know, there's some kind of a structure. Uh, maybe it's maybe it's a function of bureaucracy or maybe it's a function of uh, hierarchy um, that's showing, hey, there's a disconnection here. There's a there's a mismatch. Right. I mean, because ultimately what when we're talking about it through the rest of this presentation, we might have to do it in that later episode. But we're looking for mismatches. And sometimes yep. when someone uncovers that mismatch. People are going to say, hey, shut up. You're not allowed to say anything about that or oh, don't, don't say anything about that. Yeah. And you don't and nothing changes, but your competitors do factor that in. Right. So go back to Blockbuster and Netflix. They're aware of the gap. They see, hey, look, they, they think we're playing a retail game. They think we're playing a retail experience game. If I remember the story, the the, the person that they hired uh, to run Blockbuster was the, the former CEO of 7-Eleven, right? was, which was uh, uh, retail stores. Mm. Look, they, they're embracing a retail mindset. You're the competitor. And then you strike at that mismatch. You're the opposing force. Look, they 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 do everything on routine. Nobody up front can make their own decisions. We can knock them out in six days. You know, there's yeah. examples. There's examples of that. So, you know, you might think that you're preserving the integrity of the bureaucracy or the organization or whatever, but when truth is uncovered, or if something seems uncomfortable or you know heresy. You know, maybe that's where red teaming is appropriate. Well, let's 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 ask what if. Like, let's. Mm. Uh, I think Walt Disney. Uh, one of the principles of Imagineering was that there are no dumb ideas. Like, throw everything out. We might get rid of it later, but like, throw everything out. You know, because we might we might uncover a a blind spot. Yeah. So I I think we're probably probably running out of time for this now. But I think I think there's a there's an interesting kind of branch off here that we should make a note of the fragility of, of this system, right? This mm. system is far from in equilibrium, right? So it's, you know, I think there are organizations, teams, you know, historical groups of people that have found their way into a like local high point of being able to do this really well, but it's vanishingly rare that that lasts because mm -hmm this dynamic is quite fragile to personalities and like the, you know, the, the things that I've heard from what happened in, in the Marine a case were, you know, examples of, of poor leadership being promoted mm. and good leadership being drummed out for asking the wrong questions. So I think it's quite interesting. I, I, I didn't expect to go down this particular route, but, I think there's a, a really interesting avenue to open up here of like when we when we talk about groups what are the necessary conditions that you have to have in place to mitigate poor behavior mm -hmm. like um tyson young Porter talks talks about this in his book sand talk you know about social systems as a mechanism to mitigate narcissism because narcissism in leadership is the lack of humility the lack of the lack of desire to look at alternative points of view. So anyway, I, I think we could. Well, think, think, think of all the people down a rabbit hole there. No, 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 no. Think of think of all. I think you're spot on in the sense that just Boyd's own story. When you read yeah. the the Corn biography, um, you know the Mind of War by Hammond, uh, the Ian Brown book, and you know, I mean, he was fought at every level and told hey shut up you know you're not being a team player you're not being a you know you're not being a uh you know you're not part of the club you know yeah. um it reminds me when i was my youngest age who's 13 um and i i grew up in in pittsburgh was really popular uh at the time public enemy uh 
and their DJ Terminator X had a solo album. And there was uh, one of the tracks on there was called Buck Wyland, and it featured Chuck D, who was the lead singer of uh, Public Enemy, or still is the lead singer of Public Enemy, uh, and, a, and another rapper called Sister Soldier. But she had this quote in there. It says, if the truth hurts, then you'll be in pain. And if the truth drives you crazy, then you'll be insane. And when you think about that, sometimes mm -hmm. those uncomfortable truths, I've, ne I've never forgotten that that quote. I remember it clearly. But when you think about it, when you're confronted with truth or when you're confronted with reality, sometimes it's not what you want to hear. Yeah. You know, sometimes you have to address what you don't want to hear, what you don't want to deal with. And if that's going to drive you crazy, well, then, as she said, if the, if, if the truth hurts, you'll be in pain. If the truth drives you crazy, then you'll be insane. But if you're seeking and pursuing it and you want to keep your your orientation matched to reality, you're going to have to be comfortable being uncomfortable because yeah. a lot of what you've learned and experienced and everything, it's not necessarily going to fit your model. And I think you're right. This is probably where we we delve in next is really uh, dive deep on analysis and th synthesis because that's really one of the, the core parts it's, here. It's the core dynamic, isn't it? And like the, you know, another, another kind of thing at play here is that the, the companies and organizations and teams that do this well, they do it well continually because the, the longer you store up this kind of pain or insanity, the harder it is to address. Because, mm. you know, something that's a, a small pain if you do it every day, like, I don't know, getting fit, like, you know, if you do press-ups every day or push-ups, whatever you call them, if you it do them hurts. every day, you you know, yeah. you, you continue to be fit and you continue to be healthy and, and everything else. If you leave it for a, a couple of months and then try and start doing some burpees, all right, then then you're in pain. <laughs> you know, I have um we're Gen Xers, right? So I got this book, The Barbell Prescription. Yeah. Right. And it's written by uh John M. Sullivan and Annie Baker. John M. Sullivan, he's an ER doctor and he's a Marine. He was a he was an enlisted Marine before he went to college and medical school. Yeah. Well, what's fascinating is guess who writes the introduction or the sorry, the foreword? Nassim, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Oh, and really? He, huh. Because remember in Anti-Fragile, he talks about how weightlifting and, and, and barbell lifting specifically is what the what the book's about. Yeah. Um, and it's I, I use this program. And boy, I tell you, it's a, it's a mind. It, it's definitely an orientation shifter. That's for sure. Um, you can hear I just the dropped The barbell it, prescription. The barbell yeah, prescription. But out. Taleb uh, writes the... Uh, he writes the foreword because in Anti-Fragile, he talks about the stressors, yeah. the discomfort of weightlifting and how muscles get stronger when you break well, that, them up. Well, we're you're... back to hormesis again, aren't we? So Yeah. Yeah. yeah but that's the, that's the painful truth, right? That's, the, that's what oh, – because I, 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 people tell me all the time. I say, hey, hey, what are you doing? I say, oh, I'm doing this thing, the uh, starting strength. And there's three books, and one of them's called The Barbell Prescription. And Taleb wrote it forward for blah, blah, blah. I gave it to my father. My father's going to be 70 tomorrow. And I gave it to him uh, as a present last year because, you know, anybody can can, yeah. can can do this. But the point of it is, is that, ah, yeah, I don't want to do that. Ah, I would hurt my back or ah, I would hurt my shoulder. But that confrontation of the pain that you face when you start this program, you know, between my two shoulders, my neck, my back, and my knees, I had all kinds of stuff wrong with me that literally you train out. And how do you train it out? By uh, uh, confronting yourself with the barbell program. And it's mm. creating, you're putting your muscles under those stressors that make it come, make them come back uh, more resilient than they were before. That's the concept of anti-fragility. And that's what, yeah. that's what uh, Taleb is writing about. And that's what, to your point about organizations that they don't embrace that or they don't understand that well then they're fragile yeah well um, i mean and, and now we're back to kind of where we started right the the capacity for independent action that mm -hmm. is built by doing the right things consistently and you know a, a a deficit in your capacity for independent action is is accrued by not doing the right things consistently and an example of uh, you know where that builds up is, is where this breakdown between analysis and, and synthesis happens because you're not doing either or both of them enough. 
I tell you, you mentioned his name earlier, so I'll do a shameless plug for him. Um, and he's not paying me or anything. Uh, his, his work on OODA loop is excellent. Taylor Pearson. Yeah. And Taylor Pearson, if you go on his website, I believe it's Taylor Pearson dot me. Mm -hmm. um, he has book summaries and his summary notes of anti-fragile are superb. Yeah. They're, they're superb. His, his it, summary of Uda is also superb. It's actually. that is, that is absolutely superb. I probably recommend that that one more than uh, anybody, other, more than any other resource. The other one is uh, Brett McKay from the art of manliness has yeah, uh, both tremendous, good, yeah. but you know, um, Pearson hat, Taylor Pearson has a phenomenal, a summary of anti-fragile and again there's all this stuff there's 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 intersectionality in uh in all of it but yeah you mentioned hormesis that's one of the things on the on the chart inside of anti-fragility yep. yeah this it's a book worth reading and rereading if you're in this uh yeah i haven't reread it for a long time actually so i, I, will, I will queue it up all right so, mark well that we're hour and 15 in um yeah we'll so we'll start it what do you say we pick up uh next episode and we've we've started to delve into uh you know spinney's epistemic uh, evolutionary epistemology and we have the links and we hope that everybody starts digging on this stuff and we mentioned that there are youtube videos of uh of chuck explaining it himself so you don't have to take our word for it we're just sharing our impressions of it because we both i think you would agree this is it's a superb explanation of the roots of uh of uda and why it's why it's important and why it's often misunderstood so maybe when we pick up next time we'll go right into analysis and synthesis and uh good. start breaking that down awesome all right so one of n we still don't know how many n is going to be um how many no. more pages have we got <laughs> a lot i guess we have we have a ways but it's it's a discussion worth having and hopefully it challenges and stimulates some uh discussion and you know we're learning if you know yeah. if, if i thought that i was right you know i'd be wrong um <laughs> so <laughs> we've, we've got the humility to hopefully to, to know that we we could very well be wrong so yep all right until next time then i will uh, 